Hi, I am William F. Bryant, and this is another Moped episode. I'm hoping that this episode is going to blend well enough in uh, to the first two. I'm going to talk a little bit about global trade theory and a little bit about both uh, Smiths and Ricardos, although they're both supply side, and kind of dive a little bit more into Linder, who is more of a demand side, because I think demand side economics makes more sense, although it's never pushed and it's never mentioned. Uh, in fact, everything is almost always mentioned from uh, Ricardo's theories, which I find a bit interesting because, in my opinion, um, those theories literally, literally remove the individual and the individual uh, innovation thinking and uh, decision making completely out of the equation and basically put everything in, in, the, in the hands of the um, fortuitous circumstances of being in a given location with certain resources and, and really takes away from the entrepreneurial spirit that actually drives innovation, um, in my opinion. But if you look at what Ricardo said and how uh, Keynesian economics and even Marxism is drawn from that, which actually makes perfect sense when looking at the the way he presents his material, you can draw the conclusion that it's the collective that is um, the collective is what is most important and the individuals just specialize for the collective. They don't specialize for themselves. Uh, and, and so I think that looking at those theories but then going into demand and showing how that aspect or that uh, perspective, which I think is more realistic, actually lends more credence to the individual and uh, self-sufficiency and really just points out that the specialization they're talking about is more for convenience of saving time than it is um, anything beyond that aspect. In, in, in which, to, I mean, uh, which is more just a simply a, a convenience of time. And granted, there's efficiencies and consumer benefits when you get more than one person to do uh, different tasks and so on. But it comes down to the fact that you can't necessarily do all those tasks at a particular given time and you still need all those items. So it makes it in your best interest to just focus on one, have other people focus on other things and then trade for those items because you need them. But again, that's a demand aspect, which is why I think specialization comes from that. Um, so let's kind of roll back here and begin with uh, the couple of trade theories here. First, we'll talk about Smith. Uh, he's credited with absolute cost advantage. Now, I mean, these things are just going to be terms. It, and so I'll, I'll give you the terms and then I'll, I'll give a brief explanation of what they are. I never really care if anybody remembers them or not. Uh, I usually get the point when they're discussing theory or philosophy. Some people pride themselves on knowing all those things and they get this arrogant air about being able to regurgitate stuff like that, but I don't really think it matters if you get your point across and the concepts that you want. Uh, I think most of the time terms are just simply to separate the quote-unquote layman from the experts and so the experts get to feel special about whatever it is that they've uh, memorized and regurgitated but it doesn't really lend to a general conversation and uh, and I think that's a, a negative all in all especially when you're trying to gather knowledge uh, about a particular topic uh, that aside Smith um, He's credited with absolute cost advantage. I'll be referencing a paper by Jorge Morales. Uh, it's a 2010 paper. And a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be saying about Smith and Ricardo are going to come from his paper. He did a kind of a an overall encapsulated paper on why Ricardo and Smith's theories are considered opposing theories, why they're not really, what happened in the misinterpretations, and why it's persisted. It's a really good paper if you want to look it up. He, uh, he, it's short, it's 20 pages, it's not an extremely long paper, and it's even double spaced, so it's pretty quick to get through. But 
it, it definitely gives different insight into um, misperceptions and knowledge that is passed along because false knowledge is passed along is still false knowledge. It doesn't it doesn't do you any good to pass along knowledge. And the reason why I reference is because a lot of times uh, econ folks tend to believe that knowledge begets innovation, but false knowledge doesn't beget innovation, doesn't beget more productivity, doesn't beget anything. It's just like practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. It's the exact same concept. And so you have to you have to test the knowledge and push the limits of the knowledge and figure out what is wrong with the knowledge um, before you accept it as such. And too many people end up being sounding boards that just all agree with the, the mainstream so they don't get lambasted because those who step outside of it generally do. And that does not adhere to the knowledge building that um, intellectuals are supposed to be striving for. Anyway, so Smith comes out. He, uh, he has the absolute cost theory. Interestingly enough, he doesn't actually mention this or define it anywhere in his works, and Morales goes through and explains that he's never found anything. It's more implied, and so he's credited with this theory. But the theory basically says that uh, trade between nations um, or individuals, they, they always reference nations, um, but uh, it emerges because of advantages of specialization, meaning that an individual uh, nation, firm, whatever, specializes in the creation of one product. Um, and the differences in the choice of specialization don't result from the location that you're at, but result from, all right, now we're back. Sorry, I had to change the battery. Um, but Smith says that the trade, I'm um, going back over this, it emerges from the advantage of whatever specialization is chosen, not the area in which you're located in. And Ricardo kind of goes the opposite way and says that that specialization emerges because of the pre-existing um, differences in wherever you're located, as opposed to uh, as opposed to like choice that you make and what you want to produce or create in that specialization you've chosen. And so he's looking at things in terms of available resources and inputs to produce products. Smith is looking at it in terms of an entrepreneurial endeavor where you choose to go into a particular pro uh, profession or or create a specific good or service, and you just simply do that regardless of what's around you, and may you make use of whatever you can to do so. Um, and if you can bring in goods to create that, then you know that's your choice. the The idea of trade, then, because th this obviously can occur in an area, but the the difference is, is that. Smith doesn't necessarily have to revolve to trade outside of a border. Ricardo's is specifically designed around a country looking for things to trade abroad. Smith's can just simply be done amongst people in a given area. And, and then it actually can be expanded across borders, the same concept, where Ricardo's isn't. If a given area um, has certain goods, then everybody has access to those goods. Uh, then you just have an extremely competitive market where everybody's a price taker and and it doesn't really make um, a difference where you're at. You're specifically using these assets to trade um, and, and, and hoping that somebody else can't do it as efficiently and, and cost effectively as you can, or even if they can, that they still have better uses of their time to create other things. And, and that's where his, his theory kind of comes into play. The, the interesting thing I think about that is the fact that the comparative advantage theory is almost like the poor countries up uh, scenario and they never get ahead using this theory because they're then using the, the absolute immediately available um, items and, and doing grunt work while the rest of the economies are all doing, you know, quote unquote, more high skilled labor. In, in actually using entrepreneurial innovation and things of that nature. And, and so it, 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 it doesn't really seem to do any benefit to the countries that are using this comparative advantage. They're, they're almost just trying to get a foothold in the game and never really can get a foothold in the game because the items that they're producing, given what they have, um, are on that 
lower end of demand and cost curve anyway, and the other countries don't necessarily or wouldn't even um, necessarily have to produce them, or would it would be so it would be such an opportunity cost for those countries to produce them that they would be given up much. Uh, higher valued, uh, higher priced goods that they are producing uh, in their country. And so it, it, it really ends up being that the lower countries are just kind of working for the uh, higher end economies when they're doing these things. Where if they looked at the other, other way around and didn't look to do the, the trade initially and, and took Smith's route where they decided to create things for themselves in their area and then developed off of that and found something that maybe was desired by everybody in that route and then looked to trade uh, abroad, they would probably have a much better chance at making it on the market. Um, you know, if they were putting capital into actual innovation and entrepreneurship on those endeavors rather than just taking what was readily available so often for these countries it just ends up being raw materials that they're literally um, strip mining out of their area and just selling those but then those are being turned into extremely valuable goods somewhere else and it's not helping these countries any to do this i mean it, it's 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 a, it's a peculiar situation when you look at the way um the way it's actually uh, set up and of course it's all country wise and uh, the specializations um, for that don't tend to be all that uh, all that special it's just special because of the resources that are available and not available other places for the most part the, the in the end um, regardless like what you find is the trade the trade is actually just developed because of the fact that if if somebody else is able to produce a good that costs you a lot more to produce it somewhere else, then it's in your best advantage to take whatever else is you're making that you have access of and trade with them for those goods. And that just kind of makes sense. To use it on a, on a simpler term, consider the fact, like I said earlier, uh, of time. You, you go out and you know, say, uh, say you're a farmer and so you've got to go out and you're working fields uh, most of the day. Uh, somebody else decides, you know, they're going to be a, uh, a shoemaker. Somebody else is a clothing maker. We're just going to go real simple, uh, real simple stuff here. And, and so because each of these people are doing these things, you don't have to spend time making your own clothes, making your own shoes, uh, making tools, if blacksmiths or whatever. And, uh, and I mean, I mean, obviously, this is that is a really simple term, but you, you get the idea. These these firms have just you know advanced uh, technologically, but they do basically the same thing. Because you're not, you don't have to do that, but you still need all of those things. Then time can be devoted to a particular area, and uh, and you don't have to devote time to each one of these areas, and not getting nearly as much done. And that's pretty straightforward, and you can understand how specialization can be beneficial to the individual the the issue that i have with specialization is the fact that at some point specialization can actually become a hindrance because no one ever takes into consideration the risk associated with specialization if at a certain point you lose knowledge outside of your area and it affects your livelihood well then you've now got that opportunity to cost of specializing in a given area but losing this knowledge in these other areas which you may need at some other point in time on the most basic level you can look at self-sufficiency nobody these days seems to know how to do the the most basic things um, whether it's using a hammer and a, and a screwdriver and maybe doing basic plumbing or even finding the uh, the uh, fuse box to turn lights on it's a very peculiar situation where we're in where people believe that this specialization of knowledge they'll go all the way through and get phds but they'll they'll not really have a concept on how to pump gas and and i know that's a, kind of an extreme but you know if you've ever seen people like that you should get the point there there's always a, a place at which specialization goes so far that it's needless to go beyond that and you're sacrificing too much else and you're that time going in there where that time could have been spent to expand your horizons in other areas um, I also feel that specialization once you go beyond that point it actually hinders innovation and hinders entrepreneurship because 
the one thing that entrepreneurs entrepreneurs have um, is the capability to see multiple things. However, because nothing is um, nothing is set up for individuals to succeed. Everything is set up on more of the uh, more of the overall best for firm, best for country aspect because of the everything branching off of. Uh, uh, Ricard, Ricardian theory, then the the entrepreneurs are kind of, kind of are put by the wayside, and of course they, they both have their their separate concepts for uh, innovation and productivity. But the the individual is the one who actually becomes the productive one. It's not it's not the it's not the the knowledge base that develops from doing the same thing over and over again that all of a sudden you become productive. That's not where firms have um, investment in money. It just it doesn't happen that way. It, it takes an individual to do so. Uh, and so to, to explain that a little bit, you're a firm, you're making a product. Uh, all of your money is going into the inputs and inputs and supply chain to make those products. They, uh, and then deliver them to customers. You don't really have a, a lot of money to set aside for research and development because if you're researching your own processes, they may or may not be fruitful um, in the research. And so you don't really waste money on that side unless you can show huge gains from it. Most of the time, that's not something that uh, any one firm can benefit from if they're doing their own research and development. So what you have is somebody else who goes out and says, wow, I see all these firms doing these things. They could all use such and such, and such uh, an application or software. And so they go and develop this and then they turn around and sell it to these companies and they make money because they've now sold to a number of companies and they've done all their own um, R&D and invested in that. And because it's been beneficial to a number of places, that's where um, the money is made for that individual. And that's the entrepreneur aspect and that's the, that's the individual going out and seeing this and being able to do something the firms themselves aren't able to and specialization by the firms isn't able to what specialization does do is if a firm has a proven method for doing something say um, they're the best uh, mining company or oil drilling or something like that then they can get called on to use those years and years and years of experience that have proven true to use that as like consulting or something for another uh, firm in another country or another area that doesn't have the same knowledge base and years of experience doing something it doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to be a firm that develops new drilling techniques that you know that's not really in their business and they may come across on accident but usually it's someone within the firm that sees something develops something and then pushes it out it's the individual that is the innovator that's why a lot of these companies when you work for them have you sign uh, agreements in which anything that you develop you don't really own the patent to the company does and and you know you have non-compete clauses and all of these other things because you gain things as an individual that that company still wants rights to because as an individual certain people are the thinkers they're the they're the ones willing to make a mistake they're the ones willing to go against the grain and take all of the heat um, from the quote-unquote experts and knowledge base that say it can't be done a certain way and then the individual makes the errors and hopefully learns from the errors and keeps going and pushing it's a very unique spirit to be an entrepreneur and and, and push the limit um, push the limits and, and take all that heat of course in our current system and the Ricardian system, it's almost it's almost a, a negative to be that. It's pushed that way. Uh, the the concept of the jack of all trades, but ace of none, and and, and that it, it brings up a ne negative connotation of knowing too many things, and that means you must not be good at any of them. But that's just simply not true. It, it just means that you have a lot of experience in a number of different areas. Some of the greatest minds and in, um, inventors, thinkers, writers that the world has ever known specialized and, and literally specialized in a lot of areas. You could say jack of all trades, but then they were they use that jack of all trades to then become aces of one and then another and then another. If you're, think of it this way, if you're at the level of a jack, how much farther is it to be an ace? You know, if you have three bachelor's degrees, you know, how much is it to get that next master's? Oh, and then another master's. And, you know, I mean, and, that, and that's the concepts, but people don't think of it that way. 
but it should be thought of that way because the specialization takes you to a point where you are pigeonholed not only in the area of your expertise, but you're pigeonholed in your ability to see the world and you can't see anything outside that little hole. And, and so you really don't have the ability to apply that anywhere else. You just know what you've been told, what you've been taught, the information you're regurgitating, and not anything beyond that aspect to really be innovative or helpful in that industry. And that's what happens with um, an awful lot with professors. That's why institutions bring in people who have actually been entrepreneurs and been leaders out in industry, especially in, uh, especially in MBA programs and uh, graduate studies in business. They take people who've actually done it and bring them in because they've seen things work and things not work and they've tried to be innovative they try to create things they try to try to, to try to be that new guidance down some other um, path with some other product and some other creation uh, rather than than just sticking to the the ideas and concepts and theories that don't ever really get tested they just become base knowledge and take years and years and years to change that base knowledge even if it if it's believed to be wrong at some point in time or another now, that's not that's not necessary that's not to take away from professorships and um, education because obviously it's important to have that knowledge base and have people pass along that knowledge base I'm just saying that there are certain folks who are also needed by society who are those entrepreneurs who should not be looked at like the jack of all trades and and and, and really kind of um looked at to learn um, a variety of skills and then excel at those things and the the saying should be jack of all trades you know um how many can you ace or whatever you know um or how many have you aced uh, something like that where where then it's you know you cover all of these things especially as a, a business owner and operator and you're covering finance accounting marketing um you know sales it, human resources a number of different areas how many of those things are you extremely knowledgeable at and how many do you just kind of like you know cover and and that's uh that's kind of an aspect that obviously i'm kind of passionate about because i i think that the entrepreneurial role is under undervalued the reason why going back to now the specialization aspect is because of the fact that when you look at things from the resources that you're um that you're bestowed like in uh, ricardo's comparative advantage and you just go from there and so you specialize whenever it is you're only specializing in the you know quote unquote production of a certain raw material or a certain product or a certain um, uh, piece of a product and and that's what you're going to focus on but that just like I said that knowledge does not beget innovation or more creativity as long as whatever you're doing suffices then you just keep doing it that way there's a uh, when you look at it and there's always going to be some market there for whatever it is you're doing then there's no reason to to do anything better and perhaps you don't have the capital to do anything better or the innovators to do anything more with what you have it's it's always a unique individual mind that does those things but then the concept of specialization has gotten thrown way out of whack as well specialization was yes for a benefit to save time for an individual is the way um, I see it and then obviously when firms do it it makes sense as well you're providing a particular good but to to look at it specialization was also created so every member of society could be productive in society and that's something that's overlooked there are just simply some people who have capabilities education um, backgrounds and um, aptitude to do higher skilled positions and then a whole lot who don't and there's a whole gray area there's a whole gray area in between. And so in order to get the folks who don't necessarily have that aptitude also to be productive, you simplify and specialize in skills. It's your division of labor simplified down and specialized. And it's like uh, Henry Ford doing manufacturing, where 
each and every single component. Even if you had just one person screwing on one part and that's all they did all day, which doesn't you know really stress the skill base, but anybody can do it and anybody can be productive, that gives a position for somebody who normally couldn't do something uh, somewhere else in the overall economy. And that adds to the productivity of the economy. And so when you're looking at specialization, it, it really wasn't for the folks who had the capability of learning multiple trades, multiple areas. Those people were supposed to be the entrepreneurs and innovators and keep the productivity going. Now, specialization does uh, help to a degree because if you do know the ins and outs and everything, you... Um, you can become extremely effective in your area, but like I said, it has it's up to a point. Beyond a certain point, does it really matter how much more specialization, how much more focus it goes into? It really depends on the position you're going into. Uh, one of the things that I think, um, you know, lighten this up real quick, uh, lighten it up a little bit. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that, uh, was brought up uh, in, an, in an article. The surgeons that are coming out today and going through med school, they obviously have the brain aptitude to go through things, but they don't have the fine motor skills. They've not spent the time doing, they don't really have the fine motor skills. They haven't spent the time uh, building you know, Lego towers or uh, working on um, actual robotics projects where you're screwing in tiny fine um, screws and, and putting together wires and nails and, and doing these things that 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 you would have been doing um, at, in different generations rather than spending all of your time on tech and computers. And so those fine motor skills aren't there and you need those to be a surgeon. But when you don't have those, then you're just kind of left with... Uh, you're just left with your brain power and that specialization and that focus, but it doesn't mean that you're well-rounded in these other areas that have would have developed um, abilities that then become beneficial for the area that you want to focus in. And so that makes a, a difference. And maybe you never wanted to be a carpenter or a woodworker or anything like that, but having done those skills that would have been beneficial um, for you to... Uh, to be a surgeon later on because it developed fine motor skills. Um, the the thing about um, the thing about the Ricardian theory is also the fact that once again it doesn't really stem to the entrepreneur, the individual. It stems to the the benefit of the firm, uh, a country, the collective, whatever. And you're just doing an assigned role, which is why I believe that it's got a strong drawing. Um, for that uh, Marxian theory, and even um, and even government and expenditures, um, because of the fact that as people run specializations, they if you don't have a lot of abilities, the specialization that's what you do, and that's all you can do. If you only specialize in stuff, you lose abilities to do things in other areas, just like um, the fine motor skills aspect. But in certain um, regards, you lose other basic. Um, self-sufficiency, uh, basic self-sufficiency knowledge that may become useful were your industry to completely collapse. And industries do collapse. So if you were to specialize in a given area and your industry goes under, then what are you left to do? Well, because of your specialization, you're now dependent upon government. You don't have self-sufficiency. You, uh, you're you're left really to the to the whims of whatever's going on, and so then you vote for government that will in, uh, put in place uh, tariffs or union deals or any of these other aspects that uh, guarantee quote unquote your job or your industry safety or, or whatever. Only they never really do as the individual; it's just as a collective, and and so the the entire individual gets thrown out but because they can believe they can get you as voting blocks and so on. Then that makes a big difference. Then that theory plays into that. Where if you're running something different, um, like I still think that on on Smith's theory and free trade. It, it, it tends to be different because the individual looks to focus and because you're building your skill set and more of an entrepreneurial innovation innovative um, uh, thinker then even if your industry was to go down because of the fact that you chose that and you developed skill sets for that and you probably had to develop skill sets outside of that you are more free to move to other industries even though uh, economists always assume that if an industry is to have trouble 
and labor was to be laid off, they would just simply quote unquote retrain and then switch to another uh, industry. The only problem is, is that somebody's got to pay for that training, somebody's got to offer that training, and um, somebody's got to be able to conduct that training in order to, to have that happen. But everything works out great in their assumptions and their and their mathematical proofs that uh, that don't happen generally in the real world. So. If you're completely reliant upon government from that, from that perspective, and that uh, then supports government spending and um, and expenditures and programs and all of these kinds of things, and then the government needs to be bigger, supposedly this all supports GDP as well. You can see why people would lend to the uh, Keynesian aspects that branched off of Ricardo's uh, theories in the first place. And although it went from a classical to a neoclassical um, aspect, and Smith just simply doesn't uh, agree with the neoclassical aspects, even though the assumptions for some of the things there don't really work realistically in the real world anyway. You know that's what they that's what they go with. Don't ask everything to be realistic in the real world because if you do, it the excuse is always it makes it too difficult to quantify mathematically, and absolutely it does. You do have to make assumptions, and you make assumptions in in a number of things in uh, math and sciences when you're when you're working out equations. But those assumptions are supposed to be in a clear case base to give you something as a foundation to branch off of. They're not supposed to be assumptions that are set up just to solve an issue that kind of magically solve the issue without having any realistic foundation, if that makes sense. And that's exactly what happened with that. Um, anyway, I'm just more talking about self-sufficiency here and, um, and the fact that that kind of has gotten thrown out the window thanks to the way that they set up economic strategy. Uh, speaking of that, a number of people are going to be open free trade uh, agreement people. Uh, I wanted to make a, a brief comment on that before I go into the demand side. So open free trade, uh, and they can show how this is beneficial to the consumer and there's no uh, wasted uh, wasted aspects of the inputs and, um, and so there's no, uh, there's no inefficiencies and more variety, all these, you know, all this great stuff that happens with this. And so no, no tariffs, no subsidies, everything's just opening trade around and, and what have you. The, the, the fact is though, is that there's still different currencies amongst countries. And so those currencies add issues. The uh, exchange rates obviously play into part um, and issue, add issues to it. And then whatever goods that are traded from country to country also play into it and, and add issues with that as well. The um, It would be kind of interesting to see how that experiment goes, but everybody would have to actually be open and, and not everybody would probably uh, agree to that. And, and one of the places that kind of has acted as a, as a launching pad for that was the, the EU. And so developing a, a, a trade union initially, um, and I still maintain that this is your globalism at work here, but to open up a trade union, convince all the countries that uh, that no, no tariffs across borders, you can trade everything openly within that union. Anyone outside of that union has to you know suffer the consequences of of tariff, tariffs or other in interventions um, on their markets and so they don't get that benefit and then you find out that like I said there is the aspect of differences in uh, foreign uh, exchange rates and so you convince them that there should be a monetary union and everybody should be on the same currency now you'll notice that not everybody in uh, the European Union went to the euro but an awful lot of people did what happens is that you then go to that currency but that basically seals the coffin deal on your sovereignty as a, as a country. And, and a number of people mentioned this. And of course, the people who are pro-globalism and, and, uh, and that aspect poo-poo it. But if you're no longer allowed to print your currency and kind of deal with your own um, exchange rates and so on, even if that ends up being kind of hyperinflation, um, because you might have to deal with that, but you always, there are methods that you can you know, deal with and, and maybe um, fight your way out of that much like what I talked about with the Weimar Republic, but when you lose the ability to print money, you're then going to 
a, a foreign entity bank and asking them for money to run your government because you have to run it in a in you know a, a certain cost in their currency and you're used to running certain deficits and perhaps you can trim down perhaps you don't they give you a loan of course um it's not all that different from the u.s the u.s has benefits that other countries don't when it comes to running deficits though uh and so these countries then try to run um, on these deficits, but they're not nearly as productive as other countries are, and they can't pay back the loan, and then they get in trouble, and then they have to refinance. And uh, Italy, I believe, was the major one, but a number of countries have had issues with this over in the European Union. Uh, it was, uh, they shortened it PIGS, P-I-I-G-S, it was Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain that all... Uh, had trouble making making debt payments and uh, budgetary requirements and and kind of end up taking money from uh, other countries and and really in the end that's what these unions ended up being is just simply redistributions of wealth the the nafta was on the same terms um if you looked into that it was going to open up exactly the same way and and i still i'm I'm pro USA. I'm always, and I'm going to be, just to, to state, I don't necessarily believe in free trade. I believe in strategic trade, and uh, and and to to take that aspect and protect the 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 country you're in and the and then the people who are your uh, your fellow citizens. But that was going to open up everything and try to create something similar to the EU and and kind of usurp sovereignty that way. And I maintain that that is exactly what was going to happen because it was modeled after the European Union, which is what happened there. You've got all the people in Brussels dictating what countries can and can't do because they hold the purse strings. You know, they've got they've got the euros and they're granting them or not granting them. And that's what these countries have to deal with. Um, although they don't interesting enough, they don't want the countries to, to default either. So they have to you know play into that. The um, the. Uh, even with free trade, however, the EU, as you can see, you specialize or you use your comparative advantage and you still can't maintain um, your ability to pay for, for your debts and your deficits, uh, even with the comparative advantage. And so you may be just better off being alone on your own individually and, and going from there, which is why I always maintain the, the individual aspect. And whether that's you as a, an individual person making sure that you're aware of all the risks um, that you are taking and the opportunity costs to go along with the decisions you're making because if you do so on an individual level it will always be better um, for you as a country that way as well and you don't conjoin with all of the rest of these people because you you uh, you don't know what they're doing and what's best for them and of course this can roll all the way back to how the federal government was supposed to be set up where the most effective government was that at the local level because how is a federal government supposed to know what is needed at the local level and so individual and self-reliance and self um and self-sufficiency now um to make a point of the aspect that obviously smith and ricardo's theories are supply side theories basically what comes across is like i said if they are able to um produce something and somebody else is able to produce another uh, thing that they need but they can do it more um, more cheaply than what um, what this country can do um, themselves then of course trade the stuff that they're making already for that and and that's what trade stems from is basically excess supply and and, and needing something else that somebody else has that you don't necessarily want to try to produce and can't do as efficiently okay but that doesn't now, just to clarify, now from my perspective, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to produce that, though, because as soon as you, as soon as you are unable to produce that, even though somewhere else can do it better, and and I don't mean to have full capability all laid out all the time, because that that costs money to to maintain, but you need to have the infrastructure, you need to have that at least, um, 
and, and the infrastructure can always be used by other industries as well. But if you're going to be a government, you're going to be spending money, then spend money on something like that. So if you ever need it, and we're in a case like right now where we need to bring all our manufacturing back or something like that because it's a national emergency, you have the capability to do so. If your specialization has gone to the point where you've lost all the ability to do all that, well, that's an opportunity cost and a risk. And you get into a situation like this, even if it's not necessarily something that would happen all of the time, but it puts you in one heck of a predicament. Now, going into the uh, uh, lender's um, demand side, his was a little bit different when he talked about trade because everything stemmed from the country itself. And, um, and hereby, I think it's a little bit more related to the, uh, the aspect of free trade from, from Smith because once again, like I said, his could be within and then be extended uh, outside of the borders um, to other countries. But Linder and the, the production cycle was where if there was demand in a country for a particular good or service, somebody would find a way to provide that. And by providing that, they would service that demand. And then you, you know for certain that you have a market there. As you have that market, your, um, your ability uh, to produce will hopefully develop to being able to produce more and you develop economies of scale. And then with that, when, it, when the, um, the cost of production goes down enough that you can still transport it to another country without um, uh, losing profit or still being able to make profit, then you will open up in other markets. The other markets will, uh, will generally be related in income and preferences uh, just because they happen to find that those things uh, exist. The same income, same preferences usually have the same demands. And so then you open up over there and then those markets will kind of take trade secrets or find out, oh, hey, you know what? Um, there is a demand for this here um, or else maybe it's more efficient or, uh, than their, what they were able to produce there. But then they use those trade secrets. They develop their own um, industry. They may or may not introduce uh, tariffs and other, uh, other barriers that make it difficult for um, someone to, uh, to uh, export goods into their market. But then when they finally get um, from a fledgling to more developed and they develop those same economies of scale, then they bring back the goods and they compete in your market. And sometimes your, uh, your firm may get to that point where you don't have any, uh, your marginal costs are going up. You don't have those economies of scale anymore. Maybe you haven't been productive and you, you slacked off or you lost technology or whatever, and then you actually lose out on your market. Um, but that's like product life cycle that starts from a demand-based side. And I tend to believe that that's, that's more realistic in terms of country-to-country um, -country trade than it is looking at just terms of a comparative advantage or, or even a free trade aspect. Because I don't really think very many people, when they go into a business, look to start from um, the perspective of, hey, I'm going to make this, then I'm going to trade it abroad. You're just looking for a local market. And I don't necessarily mean local in your town, but local market in terms of the fact that, you know, you know you have within your given area a customer base because that's probably as far as you can ship and those costs are going to come into play or, you know, whatever, um, you know, shipping costs for different inputs and so on. All of those things come into play. And so a local market, local supply chains or, or, or um and uh, local distribution is usually the least expensive um, and the, the first thing to be considered. But it almost always comes from the fact that there is a demand and that demand is looking to be met because you see, hey, there's an opportunity to make money. I'm going to go for it. And, and that's where that um, the demand base also supports the, the whole idea of the, the entrepreneur being the, inter, the innovator, seeing that opportunity and going for it. It's, it's kind of like... Um, it's like a, uh, an arbitrage, uh, for, for lack of a, a better term. You, you see the potential to do something here and take these um, goods from here and bring them here and, and then sell them and make money on that. It's, it's, it's bringing goods to a marketplace, to a demand side, um, and, then, uh, and then capitalizing on that, even though arbitrage is obviously price differences, but I think the concept is kind of the same because you come to a place that has a demand for something and you create that product because of the demand. You usually don't see where, oh, hey, we have excess of this and we're just going to see if there's a market somewhere else for it. And that there may be a market somewhere else for it, but you can't rely on that and you can't produce excess because of that. You may have the potential to do so and you may kind of put out feelers for it, but that doesn't necessarily, I don't think that that's your intent from the, from the start. 
Um, and of course, then just to reiterate, because I know it's getting dark and it's getting a little bit late here, and uh, so this one will be a little bit shorter. But the aspect of specialization and the fact that I think it's been way overdone, and the risks of losing your ability to be self-sufficient or or go into other areas where your specialization to be kind of done away with or obsolete is always something that has to be aware of. And I really think that that specialization has been pushed and supported without pushing the risks and opportunity costs associated with it because it lends to control. And that control then lends to uh, much bigger things. Like I said, government, European unions, monetary unions, and so on, because it doesn't just happen to individuals. They don't just take away your options when you specialize. They take away countries the same way. And this whole thing happens. Um, it, and, um, and yes, specializing is beneficial because it saves time but it's beneficial in the point that you don't have to do something that you could do yourself and i think that's key to remember that aspect but anyway i know it's dark you can barely see me i can barely see myself <laughs> but uh um anyway thanks for listening